Arthur Parnassus. He is the the headmaster of this orphanage. He is the one that he was trying to adopt the children. Arthur has he is a phoenix himself, so he knows what it feels like to be discriminated against. He grew up in these in these orphanages. He knows what they feel like. So he came back to try and make sure that no child under his care ever goes through what he went through. He wants to bring them joy and happiness and safety because that's the thing that children need most. What I love about kids, even though I never want to have any of my own, what I love about kids is that they don't yet have the cynicism or filter that comes with age. Kids say whatever's in their head whenever they want, and it's sometimes the craziest shit that you could ever think of. But it's so cool because they get to be kids. I had always wanted to do something with with magical children and, and the bigotry that they would face. So I started researching orphanages and stuff like that and to figure out how those things look and, and what they are like. And I don't know, you. everybody probably remembers about this time, but around this time is when the prior administration of the United States of America were separating families at the Southern border, basically putting taking children away from their parents and essentially putting them into cages is what was going on. And I started reading about that more and more and more, doing research about that. And I learned that not only was this happening in the United States, but this had happened in every country around the world at some point in history. At some point in history, families have been taken from their homes and, and separated just for the simple fact that they don't fit the status quo the norm, what society, however wrong it is, deems as socially acceptable. I have witnessed many other forms of bigotry to people in walks of life I will never be part of. I don't know what it's like to be a trans person. I don't know what it means to be a person of color because I'm a white dude. But here's the thing. I know what hate looks like. I know what vitriol looks like. I know what anger looks like, however unjustified that it is. So, there's the adage of you have to kill things with kindness. <clears throat> My belief is, yeah, you can do that, or you can stab them with kindness and make it hurt that much worse. Stab them with kindness. Be vigilant in who you associate with, who you love, and make sure that the people that you surround yourself with are the people who want the best version of you. That is why I wrote that book. I wanted happiness in the world. I didn't feel happy because of the shape of the world. And I wanted to write a book where the good guys win always and the bad guys never will because that's the way it should be. The House in the Cerulean Sea was my first book with my publisher, Tor. Um, <clears throat> I originally had sold them the three book, The Extraordinary series. Well, The Extraordinaries was written with a plan to write two more. And then I wrote The House in the Cerulean Sea, and I was like, okay, why don't we just give this to Tor and see if they want to do anything with it? I'm already working on Tor Teen, so see if they want to do it. And Tor said, hell yeah, we'll take that and two other adult books, if you don't mind. And I said, sure, why not? So you got to imagine this, man. You got to you gotta imagine you're being told, you got this six-figure publishing deal. You're big shit now. And your book is going to be released in hardcover and you're going to go on a national tour. The, I sold Cerulean Sea in 2018, end of 2018. So for the next year and a half, all I heard was, all right, release day, release day. 2020, man. 2020 is going to be your year. 2020 is going to be a year that changes everything for everybody. And I'm sitting there thinking, 2020, 2020, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And then, you know, December of 2019, I'm going out to all these places. I'm going out to to meet people. Like I, I went to uh, Winter Institute in, in uh, uh, Philadelphia, where I got to meet all these librarians and everything like that. And I, I was seated at a table and like the big wig of Tor Publishing was with me. She was showing me around and introducing me to people. And so she said, okay, you can sit at this table here. And if people want to come up and bring arcs of Cerulean Sea for you to sign, you can do it. And I said, okay, that's fine. I didn't expect anybody to come because who was I? I was this medium-sized fish in a small pond who's now a minnow 
in the ocean. So what did I know? But the weirdest thing happened. Librarian after librarian kept coming up to me saying they'd read The House in the Sterling Sea and that they could not wait to share it with their community. And I was like, all right, all right, this is good. This is good. Getting the hype, building it up. Everything's going my way. Everything's coming up, TJ. And then the pandemic. <laughs> the pandemic. I kid you not. March 17, 2020, a Tuesday. That was the day the pandemic exploded in the United States. Oh, we'd have rumblings up until then. People were getting sick. People were, you know, it was far away. I remember in December hearing things about in Europe, people getting sick and, and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, everybody was out there going to the grocery store and buying every piece of toilet paper for reasons I still don't understand, bringing it home and wiping it down. All while me going, hey, do you want to read a book about kindness and the Antichrist? I got it right here for you. I know the world's on fire, but maybe this will make you feel a little bit better. And now let for some brutal honesty. Ready? That book came out and sold, that first week sold 4,500 copies. And I had sold more in the first week with self-published titles. I was furious. I was embarrassed. I was furious at myself for thinking that this, oh, why did I build this up in my head? Why did I think that this was going to be this explosion like had happened with my first book? It was my own hubris. I honestly thought that this was the start of something amazing. And it was. Because here's the thing. That book has had a tail on it like no other book I've written. Nine months after it came out, it debuted on the New York Times bestseller list and stayed there for eight weeks. And as of the third anniversary last March, had sold over a million copies in North America alone. That's extraordinary. That is ridiculous, stupid, and so humbling that I don't even really have work. I don't know how it happened. I don't know why it happened. I don't know if it was rose-tinted glasses because of the pandemic. I don't know if it was time and place. And it sucks to have to say it because of the pandemic and everybody that who lost their lives and everybody who got sick. But was that luck that the book just happened to come out at a time when people might need it most? I don't know. It's this whole confluence of things that I never, never really quite figured out, but it happened and I'm grateful for it. In the Lives of Puppets is my most recent novel. It came out last year and it exists <laughs> because I bought a room of vacuum. And I, I had been playing a long time with wanting to do a retelling of Carlo Collodi's The Adventures of Pinocchio, because I love that story. The original version of Carlo Collodi's Pinocchio, when he was writing it, it was going to be uh, released uh, uh, chapter-wise, like, like they used to do in magazines and newspapers. They release a chapter a month or a week. When he wrote the original story, he ended it by killing off Pinocchio, having him hung from a tree for his hubris at wanting to become human. Collodi's editor said, hey, you're writing for kids. You can't do that. So Collodi went back and changed the ending to what we know it is today, where Pinocchio gets to become a real boy and gets to live with Geppetto. And then you see the Disney version. And it's all the darkness has been removed, except if you remember the cartoon, the scene where the boys turn into donkeys is still one of the most terrifying things that I have ever seen put to an animated film. So I've been playing around with an idea of Pinocchio. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't know. I, I, I guess it was going to involve puppets somehow. I wasn't quite sure. Then one day I bought a Roomba vacuum. And because I'm a human being and we do weird things like that, I put googly eyes on my little Roomba vacuum. Then I turned it on. When you turn on a room of vacuum, they have to go around and map out your house the first time so they know where to go. This stupid little machine got stuck in the first five minutes in a corner and made the saddest beeping sound I have ever heard any machine make. It's never happened to me before or since, but at that moment, this entire world exploded in my head. I could see the characters. I could see the journey. I didn't know the particulars, but the shape was there, and all I needed to do was go and fill it in. And it was because of this little Roomba vacuum cleaner that I bought. So much so that he's in the story. His name is Rambo and he's a vacuum cleaner with social anxiety. 
And there's a nursing machine named Nurse Ratched, who, which stands for Nursing Registered Automaton to Care, Heal, Educate, and Drill. And then there's Vic, the only human in this little group, in this wasteland, in the forest of Oregon, after all of humanity is gone, or we think they're gone, and machines have taken over the world. What does it look like for a human to exist, to live, to learn, to grow? And what does it look like for this human in particular who has been raised by machines? Would he be like a machine or would be his, or would his humanity still be so undeniable that it'd be bursting from him? I like to think it's the latter. And that book, that book took a lot out of me to write. I've got a 10,000 word short story that's coming out for free that is set in the same world of In the Lives of Puppets, except it is hundreds of years before that book and set in a time when humans and machines coexisted and what that looks like. It is my first foray into horror, which is my favorite genre ever. Um, after that is the hardcover release of the final book in the Green Creek series, uh, Brother Song, that comes out, I believe, this summer. Heart Song, the third book, comes out at the end of this month. And then this fall is probably the biggest book I've ever written, which is the sequel to The House in the Cerulean Sea. Uh, it comes out September 10th, and it's called Somewhere Beyond the Sea. And it is probably the most important book I've written. And there's a very specific reason. It was, it when I'd written it, it was, should have come out in 2025. But because of what I'd written in it and how I'd written it and what I have to say, I asked that we push it up to right before the, the 2024 election. Because this book, I have, I have lots to say.